Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Maddie Acey. I will be your host for this webinar. Today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Using the Internet Archives for Genealogy. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star Blog and Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner, and we're here with another webinar from the Brigham Young University Family History Library. Uh, remind all of our watchers that these uh, webinars are recorded and uploaded to the Brigham Young University YouTube channel, excuse me, Brigham Young University Family History Library YouTube channel. And um, if you would like, and we invite you to subscribe to the channel and you'll receive notice of any of the newer videos that are uploaded. Today we're going to talk about using in the Internet Archive for genealogy. And uh, I'm surprised always that so few genealogists know about the Internet Archive. Uh, they may use it even without knowing. And I've had feedback about the, about the program that said, well, how do you use it? How does it work? Where is it? Uh, these kinds of things. And so we decided that we would focus on the Internet Archive. Uh, I would uh, put the Internet Archive into the top 10, uh, maybe even the top five of places where genealogists can go to find uh, original source material. Uh, interesting that, uh, that that's the case uh, because it is uh, so often ignored. Uh, first of all, what is the Internet Archive? The Internet Archive is a huge website. Uh, it was started many years ago uh, to, uh, to begin the process of digitizing all of the world's knowledge. Uh, it's one of those websites like Google or others who have made a, a definite a business decision to, uh, to, to do that. Now, the Internet Archive is not a business. It's a, a nonprofit corporation. It is also, uh, it's also sponsored by a foundation. It is, a, um, it is basically uh, the motivating factor for many of the digitizing projects that have occurred around the world, including here at Brigham Young. They were uh, the Internet Archive people were the ones who came and helped uh, Brigham Young University get started with their digitizing projects. Um, in, other, in other cases, uh, they've assisted uh, the Library Congress, uh, National Archives, and others. Uh, they are uh, one of the premier uh, websites. Now they're associated with another of a, 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 a number of other websites and we'll talk about those during the presentation. But first we'll kind of an introduction to the website itself. It is archive.org and uh, as it was described by um, someone from the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, the Internet Archive has created a kind of test tube that allows a broad range of researchers to analyze the web in ways that have never been possible before. What makes this type of research unique is that it often requires the fusion of traditional tools and techniques with new methods, and it results in the development of new theories, techniques, and metrics. Now, that may seem a little complicated, but what he's saying here is that the Internet Archive, by creating uh, some of the uh, storage bases, databases that they've uh, created, have uh, actually created so much content that it's a, that the uh, analysts are able to use the Internet Archive uh, for investigations into how the Internet itself is operating. Um, and this comes about in part because of uh, some of the things that they've done that we'll talk about here today. 
uh, let me just kind of give you an overview of some of the things that are on the Internet Archive. And these numbers change constantly because they're always adding more information. There are over 10 million digitized freely accessible books and, and over 2.6 million videos. Now, where does this content come from? Um, basically, that comes from the Internet Archive being out there digitizing content. In the case of the videos, these are videos that acquired from the United States government. They're videos that have been submitted by individuals. They're uh, older videos that have uh, been passed into the public domain. Uh, there are all sorts of, of um, uh, video things. There are over 3 million recorded music concerts on this. Um, now, what does that mean? Well. Uh, throughout the United States, uh, there are groups of musicians who put on concerts who have either never never recorded their music on uh, or for sale or have uh, basically uh, passed their music out into the public domain. And in this case, the, the, um, they've accumulated three million of these recorded concerts. So if you listen to a music group uh, years and years ago that you can remember but have never been able to find, you probably can find them here on the uh, Internet Archive. Have over 143,000 archive software programs. This is a new program by Internet Archive. What they are doing here is taking the old abandoned software that ran on the old computers, uh, the uh, pre-DOS uh, computers, and uh, some of the individual ones. And what they've done is they've written translation programs that allows you to run some of these programs on your uh, PCs or on your Mac computers. So if you're a, an ab, uh, if you've uh, wished you could go back and play the old Pong games and uh, and asteroids and and Space Invaders and some of the early programs, they're all there, and they can all be played. I don't really like to tell people that because then they all run there and that use up all their time that they would be doing genealogy. But uh, that's what they have. They have over 1.2 million images. Uh, their software programs and their images are new, uh, meaning in the last uh, year or so that they be only began accumulating these and, and already they have uh, substantial numbers. And over 166,000 audio recordings these are different than the music concerts. These are recordings of everything from presidential speeches to uh, Southern uh, Baptist preachers, all sorts of recordings made around uh, the world. I've even had genealogists who have gone in here and searched and found recordings of their ancestors on the Internet Archive. Uh, they have now added what's called 216,000 media collections. and. Uh, these are um, uh, uh, subject-oriented collections of specific media, meaning a, a broad spectrum of recordings, audio, visual, and digitized material. Now, the last but not least is the Wayback Machine, which is an Internet Archive. Uh, systematically, the uh, Internet Archive has been archiving websites going back to almost the origin of the Internet. And they have 498 billion web pages saved. That's a lot of web pages. And if you uh, the um, if you can remember the the address or if you can remember a website, uh, sometimes you can find copies of these old websites on the Wayback Machine in their archives. So this is a huge archive of what's uh, the content. And the re and the quote I just uh, uh, had in the previous slide. Uh, is basically aimed at this huge uh, record, uh, historical recording of everything that's been on the internet. We can see trends, we can see what people are interested in, we can go in here and investigate a lot of social content that um, isn't available anyplace else in the world. Okay, so this is uh, sort of the overwhelming thing. Now, 10 million digitized freely accessible books uh, uh, may be compared to, to Google or to, to uh, some of the other websites may not seem impressive except that uh, one important thing that I'll repeat more than once during this presentation and that is that everything on the Internet Archive is public domain, fully accessible, freely downloadable and usable by people without concern for, their, uh, for somebody coming along and claiming rights to all this material. First of all, 
uh, they do have 2,683 Grateful Dead concerts. Um, just a note about the Grateful Dead. Most of uh, most people uh, in the United States probably recognize the name, but uh, very few. I realize uh, there's a lot of what they call deadheads, people out there who are Grateful Dead fans. Lots of people who are Grateful Dead fans. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a genealogical connection here because I often ask the question of who were the Grateful Dead. And a lot of people say, well, they were a hard rock group. And I say, well, not really. They played a lot of jazz. And their lead guitarist, Jerry Garcia, was one of the, one of the most uh, accomplished bluegrass guitarists in the country. And uh, you know, they really can't be characterized quite so narrowly as being just another one of those 1960s hard rock groups. But the Grateful Dead, who were the Grateful Dead? Well, the Grateful Dead, and this is really where the name came from, if you are uh, like a genealogist and you do research and you find a grave, an unmarked grave of one of your ancestors, which has happened recently in our family, and you decide to mark the grave, so you go out and get a headstone or you do some, make an effort to mark the grave, then that person, the, the, the soul of the, of the person who is dead, then owes you a debt. It owes you a benefit and they become the grateful dead. So the grateful dead are those people who who out there who are giving you a benefit. Um, just thought that's always an interesting thing to have for connection here. Um, just for those of you who know what I'm talking about, they have a copy of Planet Nine from Outer Space if you'd like to watch it. So um, uh, this is known as, by the way, the absolute worst movie ever made. So it's so bad that it is almost entertaining. Uh, now, Let's get to the reality of here. We have 125,278 genealogically related items. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't other items in there that would be of value to you as a genealogist, but there are specifically this many uh, genealogy related uh, digitized books or other items that are um, specifically uh, put in a subject by the Internet Archive as related to genealogy. They also have 54,000 included in that, 54,310 books and publications on genealogy. Uh, so this is a major online collection that can be researched and uh, may be of assistance. Everything, every word in every one of these books and publications is searchable. So you can search through every one of these books for your ancestors' names and or any other information that you're specifically looking for. So this is a great resource for doing, uh, for doing research. As I, as I mentioned now a couple of times, everything is in the public domain. All of these millions and millions of records are in the public domain. And that means that we don't have to be concerned about whether or not we can use any of the information in any of our um, uh, publications or docs or blogs or documents or any place that we're going to put, it, put that information. Now, it's important to understand that in genealogy, old is good. Um, we have gotten into a mode in our culture where we are, uh, we live what for many, many years has now been called the disposable culture. And that is, we think that anything that's even partly old or unusable is, is disposable. We just kind of get rid of all the old stuff. Uh, throw out the old books, throw out the old stuff, and let's all have brand new things. Well, we are basically his, uh, interested in history, and history is preserved in all of these old publications. I have some examples here up on the screen of some of the older uh, publications that are on the Internet Archive. Well, one of them that I like to refer to occasionally is called Lessons in Genealogy that was published by the Genealogical Society of Utah back in 1915 and 1917. Um, it's amazing how much information is here. Now, one of the criticisms that arises uh, about older material, particularly genealogical uh, surname books, which are, is a generic term for writing about families and individuals, either their ancestors or their descendants, these books that uh, focus on certain families 
uh, most of the, the, the current genealogical uh, objections is that, oh, there's no sources, they didn't tell where they got all this information, and so we have to go back and re-verify it all. And so how much, how useful is it? Well, the answer to that is these books were written back when they were contemporary with your great, great, and sometimes great grandparents. So it's, it, it, you realize that they were talking to the people who were involved in this process. And although the information may not be sourced as such, some of these articles and uh, particularly uh, articles in the Journal of American Genealogy and other uh, similar uh, publications that are on the Internet Archive are sources. They are where you can go to find specific information and they may very well have additional references to where the information was obtained. So uh, this is not something that we should just dismiss out of hand. We should be aware of the importance of, of uh, looking at and examining these older publications when we have the opportunity to do so, as we do with the Internet Archive. Okay, so archive.org, <clears throat> it's important to understand that all of the text items are for, fully searchable. They have a, a general search for the website but then when you bring up any one item, then you can search within that item, within that book or that publication, and every page and every word is searchable. Um, once again, all of the items can be freely downloaded or copied, and the Internet Archive is a sense, an Internet Archive is a sense like a black hole. Uh, it sort of sucks in everything. It, there doesn't seem to be any overall plan to what they're archiving. They just, uh, if they see a block of information or uh, books or types of records, it simply gets sucked into their website. Uh, they don't have any um, compunction about uh, trying to make anything organized in the sense, which of course is a little bit disconcerting to a researcher because here we have huge piles of material uh, but we need to understand that there are some very powerful search tools available uh, with the uh, Internet Archive that will help us to find this information. Um, because, and this is uh, something that we need to remember when we think about libraries and other archives, is that because they are <clears throat> generally focused uh, on any kind of information that can be <clears throat> added to their um, to their database, then uh, that information is um, includes genealogically important documents. Uh, genealogy, as such, is um, not really a focused <clears throat> area. Uh, it includes histories, county histories, local histories, biographies. Um, uh, surname books, uh, uh, genealogical publications, all sorts of different documents that can contain information, plus newspapers, plus uh, practically any uh, printed material out there, even advertisements in newspapers can be helpful to finding ancestors. So uh, the, the strength of the Internet Archive is that it is collecting all of this information, and along with that, uh, with what it's collecting, it is uh, including a lot of information that is extremely valuable to uh, genealogists. And it's what I've found over the years is that genealogists need to expand their concept of where to research. A lot of times we focus on easily available. Uh, even online easily available documents. Um, I call it the, the uh, in the United States, it's, I refer to it as the U.S. Census Syndrome. And in that, it, it says that if you can find your ancestors in the census, you basically have found them and that's the end of your research. Uh, another way that it, it's viewed is that if you find your ancestors in the census, then uh, the information is, is automatically assumed to be correct and therefore uh, no further research needs to be done. In either case, you end up with sort of a we're done kind of attitude. But uh, what we try to encourage constantly by, by teaching in these classes and webinars 
is that there are a lot of places to go to obtain information about your family and that this additional information may either correct the information that's been earlier obtained or it may uh, augment it in the, in the sense of adding additional members of the family and extending family lines. So uh, the Internet Archive is uh, sort of the uh, a prototypical type of, of, uh, or of place where we would go to do that kind of expansive research. So how do we use the Internet Archive? Um, if it's a big uh, kind of disorganized, uh, or let's call it less focused um, a collection of information, it's sort of like a, a, a giant library uh, of information where uh, the people have gathered anything that they can get their hands on. Uh, first of all, we can do surname searches. Uh, you can go in and search for information about your surname families. And uh, that is not a very focused search, but often does bring up individuals who are uh, or could be possibly related. The second thing is you can do look for local and county histories. Um, we're doing some research just yesterday with one of the, um, here in the Brigham Young Phantom History Library with one of the patrons. and. Uh, Part of the research that we were finding was uh, a lot of different kinds of records that uh, mentioned the ancestor. Uh, in our case, uh, unfortunately, the information we were seeking concerning uh, finding some kind of a death record for the person didn't happen. Uh, but we did find some candidates by searching in a lot of different kinds of records, including local and state histories. This is particularly true if your ancestors were uh, some of the earliest people to arrive in a certain location or uh, immigrate or do some, uh, make some other, uh, something that puts them into a category where they would be entered into a local history. But you might be surprised to find out that your ancestors are mentioned. Um, they also have a huge collection of genealogical journals and publications. I've already uh, illustrated a couple of those in a previous slide. Uh, they have gazetteers. Now, gazetteers are um, uh, basically uh, books that talk about uh, locations and identify uh, various things that are going on in uh, different locations. That's a little general term for it, but uh, Usually you think of them in terms of maps, uh, that they list all the places on the maps and then tell some information about those places, um, either uh, having to do with their production or their population or their uh, manufacturing or whatever it is that they're involved in. Uh, but these having them online and searchable is very helpful. Uh, it certainly speeds up the process of looking at one book at a time and examining uh, the index or trying to find out if it actually says something about the place you're looking for. And the stories, audio files, and videos um, uh, shouldn't be dismissed by genealogists because you never know when, uh, when your family or your ancestor might have been involved in something that gets preserved on the Internet Archive. So we begin our searches on the Internet Archive in a, in a kind of a variety of different ways. We can search by category. So we have books, uh, which are uh, obviously textual material that's bound or uh, in pamphlet form. Uh, in this, of course, are all sorts of periodicals. As we divide that up in, in libraries, usually there's a division between books and periodicals. And uh, in this case, uh, they're both included under books. We have our video files, um, and I've explained a little bit about that. Uh, one of the things I found, for example, in the video files uh, were the uh, World War II uh, B-17 bomber training videos. Uh, this is the kind of thing that very surprisingly you'll find in, uh, in this. If you want to learn how to fly a B-17 bomber, then they're all there. Uh, there's all sorts of other information, but 
I mentioned kind of some of the some of what you might consider to be sort of off the wall or kind of wacky things that they have uh, to illustrate the fact that uh, this they have more things than you can imagine, and uh, it, it's always nice to go there as kind of a regular place to go search for things because, um, uh, importantly enough, it uh, they find things that uh, no one else seems to have. Uh, concerts, I mentioned those. I won't go into that any further. Programs, um, uh, interesting, uh, maybe uh, not uh, centrally uh, uh, applicable to genealogy, but uh, we are still people and we still might be interested. Uh, images, uh, I really haven't examined this very much. In fact, I may, uh, in considering some of the uh, things that have happened to me recently, I may uh, begin using this uh, more frequently. Uh, audio files. Uh, now, these audio files are once again very eclectic. They have uh, uh, information from all over, and it's helpful to search on the offhand possibility that one of your ancestors ended up uh, having a recording made that you were not aware of. Now, the newest one out here is called Collections, and it's a little bit even more general than some of the others. Uh, but it's an interesting way to uh, to look at the information that's here on the Internet Archive. And of course, above that, you'll see a link to the Wayback Machine, which is that red and black uh, button at the top of the page that will let you go in and look for old Internet Internet Archive websites. Uh, so if you had if something on the Internet has disappeared, uh, this is the first place you would go to try to find uh, something that you'd lost on the internet. Now you can, you can search by surname and location. There's a search tab. So you just go in and, and put in your regular searches for uh, varying the names, uh, put the names in quotes, do all sorts of things that are the general search uh, methodology that occurs out there on the internet. And then you'll see there's also a button for an advanced search that appears below uh, the search field there, and you can go in and do some very elaborate uh, searching uh, with all sorts of, uh, of options uh, of including or not including information. Uh, and uh, then there's uh, all sorts of uh, ways of choosing different types of files that may be present. A very technical and very long uh, involved advanced search page, uh, probably much more than you are used to from other website, uh, w other websites on the internet, uh, particularly the genealogy sites, which in some cases uh, have very limited search capabilities compared to what is is really available out there. So this is uh, this is the the core of finding the information. So you can search by title, you can search by the creator of the of the document or file, you can search by a description. Um, obviously, you'd have to try to guess how they describe the, the document. You can uh, search by collection. You can search by media type and date and date range. And uh, let me go back to that for just a second. And all of these can be varied. Uh, so you can use uh, a word out of the title and uh, put in a media type like a book and then even put in a date range and then still search. So they're all interchangeable, and you can use these to uh, vary back and forth and experiment in trying to find uh, pertinent information on the website. For example, uh, if I were to go in here and type in Tanner Genealogy uh, and hit the, the Go button, I would get uh, a list of books or other items on the website that uh, had either Tanner or genealogy as part of the uh, information in that particular book. In this case, I only get 19 results uh, because they uh, assume I'm looking for Tanner genealogy. And unless the, the information is there and, and uh, cataloged or arranged or whatever under Tanner gene genealogy, then it will it would not appear. But Interestingly enough, all of the entries on uh, the Internet Archive are also visible on a Google search. So when you do a Google search on any subject, 
like Tanner genealogy, and I do that at Google search again, then this one item, which of course is uh, uh, directly related to Tanner genealogy, um, appears. And if you note the address there, it is, uh, this is an item that appears on the archive.org. So in your searching online, uh, you may have uh, seen references to the archive, uh, Internet Archive, and not even realize that you were working with the Internet Archive. When you clicked on the item, it came up directly to the item, and uh, you may be, have been unaware of the other uh, resources that were available on that particular item, in that particular website, excuse me. Okay, well, this kind of brings up another subject, another uh, interesting problem. And that is the overcall question about how many of the world's records have been digitized. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of one of those, uh, uh, kind of like the medieval question of how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, um, uh, where information is lacking as to either the, the uh, the size of angels or uh, uh, their ability to or willingness to dance on anything, much, much less the head of a pin. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the is how many of the world's records have been digitized. That question, I think, has come up quite regularly on online in the genealogical uh, context. The, the question here is how many records are there on in the world? Well, you know, we have people who are willing to make those kinds of estimates, uh, but um, from my experience uh, and and having addressed this issue uh, repeatedly over the years, um, I'm not sure that that uh, anyone uh, can even give a uh, an adequate, much less even an accurate um, estimate of the number of rec records in the world. But most of the opinions about the, the uh, let's say, the percentage of records of the total world's records that have been presently digitized are based on, on presumptions that, that uh, concerning the, um, the rate of digitization, which of course is another unknown factor, and also based on the fact that um, there's a, a Kind of a prejudgment here that not all of the world's records have been digitized. There's this is kind of the, the holdout position of genealogists who are uh, either un, unfamiliar with what's online or uncomfortable uh, with what's online. So what we have here is uh, you know you can say well millions and millions of records have been digitized every day or being digitized every day, which is the truth. And then the answer comes back from uh, from many genealogists is, well, yes, but they haven't digitized all the records, and I st I still find. And then of course there's this constant launching off into a discussion about uh, how they found some very valuable records in a basement of a courthouse or in the attic of their great grandmother or something. Uh, and the answer to that is uh, there will probably always be a residual number of documents. Uh, that um, have uh, or will never be discovered or used or digitized for some reason or another. Perhaps they're destroyed before they get to be digitized. But uh, the the rejoinding question to how many documents have been digitized, how many records have been digitized, and, and viewing this from a genealogical standpoint, my question back would be, how do you know what you're looking for is not online? Um, this is kind of a really uh, an interesting question here because what the, the issue it raises is our ability as individuals to process this vast amount of information that's sitting out here on, uh, on various servers around the world and available. Um, we obviously have some information that's not available, that's uh, behind uh, uh, firewalls that prevent us from doing any searching or any viewing of the information. 
and where we still have to go to uh, an entity or institution to to view that particular information. But on the other hand, uh, there's uh, there's an overwhelming amount of information being added that's freely accessible uh, if we know where to look for it. And so there's always kind of nagging re uh, problem out there that says, how do you know that you've actually looked everywhere you need to? Uh, uh, this brings up another important point, and that is, what are the functions, what are the chief functions of, of people who are interested in doing genealogy? Uh, I think we have a, a tendency to identify genealogy with searching for families, searching for names. I want to know the names and identities and information about my ancestors. Well, that information comes from historical records. So in reality, uh, the activity of genealogists is finding records. Uh, it's incidental that we find information about our, our ancestors. Uh, that may be our goal. Uh, but uh, before we ever get to uh, finding our ancestors or names or stories or whatever information is about them, we, we can find out about them. We need to know where to find that information. So we spend an, uh, should be spending a great deal of time investigating the sources, the, the places where we might find that information. And what I've found online uh, over the past few years is that uh, we, we, of course, fall into um, a spectrum of, uh, of ancestral origins. Um, there are places in the world, very obviously, where there are few, uh, if any, genealogically important records. There are other places in the world where there are lots of genealogically important records, but they are totally unavailable to the public in the form of digitized copies as yet. And in addition, we have other areas of the world where there are literally millions and millions of records being poured onto the inter internet every day. Okay, so uh, the United States would be in one of the more accessible places where you can find inter internet information on genealogical, um, genealogically important uh, topics. Uh, countries in the in the Asia and the Far East, in the in the um, Middle East are probably those where it's more most difficult to to find such information. And then countries under very very underdeveloped countries. Uh, may not have uh, any significant records other than perhaps local church records or local um, type of registers that are now only in that country at all. Okay, but let's let's examine it from an, the standpoint of of a person living in the United States. Either their their immigrants either came recently or came in the past. In other words, we're a nation of immigrants. Um, we have a, a a sizable population of people who uh, claim to be Native Americans, but if they go back far enough in their history, they'll find out they're immigrants too. Uh, so uh, they may just might not have any records that show that, uh, that are written records. But on the other hand, uh, if we're looking for records about uh, people who live in the United States, uh, back to the point of the immigration, there are an overwhelming number of records and and so many of those records are online that for about 200 years in the past, and this is my opinion and experience, is that uh, we can find uh, most people, unless there's some really strange thing going on, like uh, they were an orphan or they were a foundling or they were really uh, isolated somehow from uh, the uh, mainstream. But we are finding more and more people having uh, a documented uh, pedigrees back to the immigrant without uh, without spending an, an inordinately large amount of time. Now, if you focus on one fact, for instance, my uh, friend who was in here yesterday looking for a, a death record, uh, there may not be one. Um, as I kept pointing out, uh, this person lived in the on the frontier in uh, in the United States and uh, could very well have gotten on his horse uh, one day and wandered off into the countryside and fallen off his horse and died. 
and nobody ever had a record of his death. But uh, that that is not uh, necessarily the most usual thing that happens. So what are all the categories of these records that are used by genealogists? Um, kind of to summarize, uh, there are so many records online and so many records going online every day uh, that uh, there is a basically a basic shift in the way that genealogists are acquiring information today. And that's uh, probably, unfortunately, the subject of another uh, presentation. But uh, that, that really is where we are. We're kind of at the crossroads of the change. So these categories of records used by, Johnny, uh, by genealogists. And we need to recognize that the availability of a record for examination by a genealogist is an entirely separate issue from the issue of whether or not the document has been digitized. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, it's because we talk about records being digitized and uh, what is, uh, but we uh, sometimes don't realize that even if they're digitized, they may not be available. For example, uh, there are many records who are in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, that are digitized records that you could go in and look at copies of. But the digitizing that they've done uh, is restricted to computers that are in the Family History Library. So even though this document is digitized, it doesn't mean that I can sit here in uh, Provo and look at it. I have to uh, travel up to Salt Lake, uh, get on a computer in the Family History Library before I can even search that document. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's just one example. Of course, I could make a lot of examples. If I want to examine a, a document in the National Archives, uh, the vast majority of which have not been digitized, I still have to travel to the National Archives. So availability and digitization are not necessarily synonymous. Now, here are some of the categories of records. Uh, unique, and, and I'm dividing this up a little differently than you might uh, expect. Uh, unique records that are presently only on paper or the equivalent. And this would be private letters, documents, photographs, uh, similar records. And by their unique nature, these documents exist only in one location. So if you've got a letter from your great grandmother that's sitting in your drawer or in your box in your, in your uh, attic or in your basement or in your storage files, uh, that may be the only copy of that document that exists. And unless it's digitized and somehow made available online, it will re continue to exist only in that one format. And secondly, we have a class of records on paper or the equivalent that originally had multiple copies stored in multiple locations. So these are books and newspapers, periodicals, short run family histories, government documents, all sorts of things. So uh, these are the kinds of things that are being captured by the digitization projects like the Internet Archive in, uh, in ways that we can't imagine today couple of more categories, documents that are available on microfilm, microfiche, or other duplication method, and are primarily stored in some sort of institutional repository. Uh, we realized that beginning around 19, late 1930s that uh, microfilm became available, and many government agencies around the world and many other repositories, libraries, and others used microfilm as a way of uh, re reducing the, uh, the need for large storage areas. So uh, particularly like uh, uh, some of the larger businesses and, uh, and others uh, took their, their documents, their paper documents, put them in uh, long-term storage and made microfilm copies of those available. Um, this, is, this is true with a lot of newspapers. Uh, many, many newspapers in the United States uh, and elsewhere digitized their old uh, holdings of newspapers and then uh, closed those to the public and uh, in some cases even disposed of the original paper documents once they had been, been digitized. Uh, excuse me, microfilmed. Uh, so we, uh, we do have a residual amount of microfilm out there. 
Now, a side note here on the uh, Family Search uh, Library in Salt Lake City, which has 2.4 million rolls of microfilm approximately. They've been in the process of digitizing those records for a number of years and recently made comments about the fact that they expected to finish that digitization process of all the records in what they call the Granite Vault uh, in about the next uh, two years, three years, and I've heard four, and now somebody yesterday told me five. Uh, I think there's kind of an un, undetermined number, but it's it's going to be in the next few years that all of those records are digitized and available online. And then we have another category of documents, documents that have been digitized and are available only in one unique location. And those are like private digitization efforts undertaken by individuals. And I guess I'm a prime example of that. I have tens of thousands of documents that I've digitized and have on my computers, on my storage devices that are not located any place else. They're simply unique documents that I had in my possession that are now in digitized format on my, on my uh, storage devices. So uh, that's another category of records. Then there's another category of documents that are digitized but still remain generally available in paper copies. These can be books and, and uh, newspapers and other widely disseminated. The, the trend, of course, today is that people who are publishing books uh, and newspapers are creating digital copies of the same uh, materials. So I just read a book that I checked out electronically from um, the, an online library. And that book is also available on, in paper form. I could go into uh, go on to Amazon and buy a copy of the book, or I could check it out from a library electronically, or I could go into a library and check out the paper copy. So there's uh, those are all out there. Uh, in addition, we have documents that have been digitized, but the original record in whatever format has been destroyed or is no longer available. Okay, so. Today what's happening is that people are viewing the fact that uh, the digital record then becomes the archive and the paper records which cost money to store and which are um, uh, can be lost or whatever are uh, then destroyed. Um, the digital copies then ha may or may not be permanent. In other words, they may also go in and become obsolete due to uh, technological changes or simply because uh, the copy of the digital document is no longer maintained and lost. So it's true that throughout history and uh, particularly from the genealogical standpoint that there's sort of a leakage out of all of these different categories of documents that are uh, misplaced, lost, destroyed, uh, become unattached from their source and therefore uh, can't be identified, such as old photographs that nobody now knows who the people are. So there's lots of things floating around there in these different categories of documents. Now, one of the things about uh, how this comes up in the context of the Internet Archive is that, is that the Internet Archive is attempting to preserve all of these types of records. In other words, uh, they're not focusing on one of these categories. They focus on all of the categories. And so you'll find documents that are unique. You'll find documents that fall into all these different categories of been, having been uh, digitized from microfilm and, and so forth. Now, there's one more category. And this was one that raises some of the greatest concerns. And that is documents that are digitized and available only to certain people who have official access. This can be anything from classified government documents to restrictive collections in university libraries. Now, it's interesting that uh, um, in a discussion, another discussion I had yesterday, that um, um, with an individual who was uh, trying to get church records, uh, and because he was of a different uh, religious persuasion than the uh, institutions that had the church records, they were unwilling to let him look at the records. Um, so this is kind of an interesting situation. In other words, this was in the United States. 
We're not talking about some foreign country, but because he belonged to a certain church and was trying to get rec records about his ancestors, the churches that his family previously belonged to would not talk to him. So he was, uh, it was kind of an interesting thing. And this is another uh, limitation on, on access to the documents. That's why it's important to note that the documents uh, that are put up on the Internet Archive are freely available, meaning they're not, not uh, restricted by any of these uh, particular issues that we're seeing. And last, um, there are documents that are now digitized that are only available by subscription. I had this happen yesterday also. Yesterday was a very uh, uh, fruitful day for issues involving documents. It was just like I was document all day long. Uh, but basically the idea here was that uh, uh, we wanted to view a website that was a subscription only website and there was no way to look at the documents which were apparently uniquely digitized on that website without the subscription. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a difficult situation. Um, and then last of all, we have the documents that are digitized and freely available on the internet of which there are millions and billions of documents. Now, as I mentioned earlier, digitization does not equal access. So uh, the idea that somehow digitizing the contents of the world's documents will make them available to genealogists is only the uh, beginning part of the story. Uh, many of the records that have appeared on the larger websites, for example, uh, uh, Family Search and Ancestry, and even uh, my heritage, uh, and to some extent find my past, uh, collections which they had previously in, available in their websites uh, have disappeared due to either the, the termination of the agreement that allowed them to, to display the documents or um, the uh, uh, change where the, uh, the individuals wanted to get paid more money or uh, decided that they would uh, put their documents up themselves or whatever. Uh, but uh, documents can come and go online. And I think the, the important underlying thing about the Internet Archive is their attempt to make these documents permanently uh, accessible online and not, uh, not be playing the games of who gets to control which documents. In summary, I'd say the important thing to understand here is that the Internet Archive is a valuable tool for genealogists and has new content being added regularly. I've watched just over the past year or so the number of books that they have in their digital collections online uh, go from around 8 million up to 10 million. So I've seen them put on 2 million books in about the last year or so. And so uh, this is kind of a, a dynamic place to go to get information about genealogy. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, remember that these videos are on the BYU Family History Library YouTube website, uh, our YouTube channel, and uh, that you can subscribe to that channel and uh, encourage you to do so. Thanks for watching again.